Hey, enough of my books. Let's talk about yours. Author C.K. Brooke here. Today I've got on the line fellow Michigander and 4814 author Christina Thompson. Welcome, Christina, and thanks so much for chatting with me this morning. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Where in Michigan are you, by the way? I am in Kalamazoo. Okay. So if you look at the mitten on your hand, mm -hmm. we're over on the west side. So did you get hit by the uh, polar vortex, oh, yeah. <laughs> the great polar vortex of 2019? <laughs> yeah, a lot of uh, lake effect snow comes our way, so oh. yeah, we have, like four feet. Brutal. Yeah, that was really something. The kids were out of school for like over a week and it was yes. just, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad you are safe and warm now. Yeah. <laughs> Folks, Christina Thompson has a Bachelor of Science degree in biology from Nazareth College in Kalamazoo, Michigan. She's a certified massage therapist from the Health Enrichment Center School of Therapeutic Massage 1000 hour program in Lapeer. She also has a diploma in traditional Chinese acupuncture from the Midwest College of Oriental Medicine in Racine, Wisconsin. Her background in biology gave her a love of science and an insight into the physical realm of the body. Her holistic understanding of traditional Chinese medicine taught her that the mind and spirit affect the body in powerful ways. As a retired acupuncturist with over 20 years of knowledge, experience, and service, Christina now enjoys writing about the physical sciences, the emotional workings of our mind and heart, and the spiritual energy that taps into our passions. She is the author of the romantic thrillers in the Chemical Attraction series, which include Their Rigid Rules, The Kindred Code, Chemical Attraction, and Chemical Reaction, all published by 4814 Publishing, one of my publishers as well. She has also written the romantic adventures The Trucker's Cat and The Garden Collection, and an anthology of short stories entitled Searching for Her. For more information on the eclectic life of Christina, visit ChristinaKThompson.com. So Christina, let's bump up to the very beginning of your bio there. You are a science lady. You've got a degree in biology and your background is in practices like acupuncture, massage, holistic healing. So that begs the question for me, how did you go from what we might call the more left-brained field of the hard sciences to the more right-brained artistic path of creative writing? Uh, well, it's kind of a, a weird story, but first I want to say Happy Chinese New Year. You're remiss of me not to with my background, so... <laughs> Happy Chinese New Year to you! <laughs> Pardon? Happy Chinese New Year to you, too! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you! The Year of the Pig, so it's success in all aspects. But to get back to your question, um, you know, I, I wasn't a, a early reader like most writers are. So my, I didn't start reading for pleasure until I got married. So my husband was a, an avid reader since uh, very young, since he could read. So they, his mom took him to the library from a very early age, and that wasn't so for me. I mean, in school you write, uh, you know, book reports, and, but I never read for pleasure. And then um, this one time, you know, just right after we got married, uh, we're sitting on the couch and I'm watching TV and he picks up his book and starts reading. And I'm like, I haven't seen you all day. Why are you reading? <laughs> and he would, he would calmly sigh and he'd put his book down and on his lap and he'd answer whatever question I had. And then he'd pick up his book again. And I just didn't get it. I'm like, I haven't seen you. What are you doing? <laughs> what kind of marriage did I get into? <laughs> and then, um, I decided, okay, well, what's his favorite series? So he was in love with The Wheel of Time by Robert Jordan. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, well, let's see what all this is about. And, of course, that started my 30-year love affair with, with reading. And then as the kids got older, I, you know, I read anything I could get my hands on. And uh, I also had an idea for a story. So just based on an idea, I kind of elaborated and like, oh, I wonder if I can write a story, you know, with the beginning and end, uh, it, it kind of snowballed. 
And so did that so, lead to you, did you dabble at first? Did you like kind of try your hand or did you just plunge right into your first book from there? I just started writing. I mean, I was, it was a book. I was like, well, can I do it? But then you have that inner critic going, well, are you good enough? Are you smart enough? You know, you <laughs> didn't really go to school for writing. What do you think you're doing? <laughs> so with a, with a nudge from my husband, I decided to do that. But my first book published wasn't the first book I wrote, so gotcha. it was still the same characters. So it's just kind of weird how that that all plays out. Yes, that does often happen where we we write our first book, but that is not our first publication, and we kind of grow from there. Um, exactly, and then cycle back sometimes, and so. <laughs> So was it just the Wheel of Time series that kind of influenced you, or were there some other books or authors that, you know, made you feel inspired, like, huh, I should try my hand at this? Um, well, that was a big, a big part of it, was the Wheel of Time, just because uh, Robert Jordan has this awesome way of, of taking this little piece of information at the beginning of the book, and then it, like, spirals and it's like oh my gosh that's the clue that we needed to you know have everything happen at the end so I try to do that in my stories you know you add this little piece like um in the chemical reaction um one of the characters Joe he he's doing karaoke and his his uh, partner takes a picture of him and then it snowballs into the whole team makes a big poster for the back of their wall you know kind of mocking him and, uh, and then that poster kind of helps uncover some uh, information down the road. So what you think is kind of minor and kind of, you know, funny mm -hmm. uh, actually, you know, has a big part of the, of the plot of the story. So I, I love that about him. I love stuff like that. And I find, like, J.K. Rowling does that as well in the Harry Potter series where she'll kind of mention something in passing, you know, or even almost as a joke, and then, but then it actually comes back later in the story as this yeah, crucial yeah. thing, and that, to me, that's so brilliant, so, um, and I know that that kind of goes with um, people who love mystery and thrillers, that tends, and I know J.K. Rowling is a huge mystery fan growing up, and so, um, and Agatha Christie and things like that, so that, um, you find that more so in kind of mystery and thriller books than you do in high fantasy, which I, I've not read the Wheel of Time series. I had assumed those were like high epic fantasy. So that's cool to hear that he incorporates those elements of mystery yeah. and that was that was inspiring to you. So so which of your books, Christina, was the first book that you wrote? Uh, well, like, you know, writers do, you know, you write and then you send out queries and then you keep writing books. So, um, Chemical Traction was the first book, and then right, like, maybe a week later, um, another book called The Trucker's Cat, um, was, I, I got an offer on it, um, from a different publisher. So that kind of was like, what? Wow. <laughs> uh, but, you know, publishers are different, which I learned pretty quick. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Working with 4814, I love that aspect of, you know, going back and forth with the editing and until we are in agreement and that whole process is, is exciting. Um, but not all publishers are the same, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, this publisher for The Trucker's Cat was uh, new to the business, but I thought, well, we all got to start somewhere, right? And uh, that, that experience wasn't pleasant at all. Uh, she changed a lot of the story without permitting me to defend my work, which, you know, it hurt. Yes. Uh, and then three months after publication, she, the publisher decided to go in a different direction and just took my, my novel off the market. Oh, was, how horrible. I was devastated. <laughs> and didn't, did you have some kind of contract there? They just broke the contract on you or? Yeah, she, I mean, I got all my rights, mm -hmm. you know, in the the cover art and all that stuff but I learned that all through like this brief email with very little explanation so I was like is this how you know the writing world works it's 
Oh, how horrible. No, not at all. Yeah. And and that's, it's funny. A lot of these, um, you know, Indian small press authors that I've been talking to on this series have had, um, you know, we've all had at least like that one negative experience where we were either ripped off or, um, or scammed or just, it, it just wasn't the best experience. And so you're not alone in that, especially when we're new and we don't know quite how to tell a reputable small press from one that it maybe is not so reputable. Um, right. But I'm happy that at least you're, you had the experience with 4814. It sounds like kind of parallel to that experience that yeah. going on at the same time. So at least you had a good publisher <laughs> to make yeah. up for the bad one. <laughs> and so was right. it, when, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say Juanita was great. She is fantastic, and she really, um, gosh, when you're a new, when you're brand new to everything, she really does hold your hand through it, and, you know, in the best way. She answers all your questions so promptly with such patience and, right. you know, thoughtfulness, and it's, it really, because it's scary, you know, the first time <laughs> that you publish, and you're about to, like, put yourself out there, you know, to the world, and, and it's it's frightening you don't know what you're doing and so it's wonderful to have a publisher who you know understands that and mentors you um so so you had said earlier that your your first book that you wrote was not the first one that was published um so so which which was which well chemical attractions first and okay. then i wrote this uh, the sequel to it, Chemical Reaction, and then uh, Their Rigid Rules was the first book that I uh, I ever wrote, so okay. that was like a total rewrite. So uh, a couple years ago, we did like a whole new uh, order, book covers, uh, with 4814. So Their Rigid Rules is actually the first book mm -hmm. of the series instead of Chemical Attraction, because it was like the prequel. Yes, I do so, have in my notes that I wanted to get to your, your whole makeover process eventually. Um, but kind of going in, in order of events here. Um, so who are these characters then that came to you and inspired you to write about them for three or four books? Um, could you kind of introduce us to your characters? You know, who are they? Where do they live? And, and what is their whole saga about? Well, the series is about Taylor, Eva, and Joe. So these are uh, best friends that have been together since the third grade. And uh, they consider themselves siblings by choice, which um, I kind of, I love that about them, that they, even though they're quirky and they have, you know, flaws, that they still embrace each other so much. So Taylor, she's kind of the planner. She's, uh, they call her Vanilla because she's just, she goes along, she's got those rules and her plan is to uh, finish college and get a job and her career and then, you know, love is way at the other end. And um, then there's Eva and she's uh, kind of a spitfire. She's uh, petite, she's a uh, redhead. She, um, she's got an opinion about everything and do you know it whether you want to or not? And I think we all have, you know, friends that are kind of <laughs> like that. And we, for me, I, I um, appreciate that about her. And then um, Joe, he's kind of a natural flirt. So um, he's, he inspires to be an FBI agent. So in the beginning, you know, they're just graduating college and they're just afraid that they're gonna start drifting apart. So, you know, they've been together every day since third grade, and now, you know, their paths are taking them different uh, different angles. So with Taylor, in their rigid rules, um, she finds romance, and she doesn't really know what to do about it because it messes with her plan. So just like uh, when you find, you know, you find love, and it just kind of, like, messes with everything. Mm-hmm. So that's just how that book starts. And at the end of that book, Eva meets um, Matt. And all of a sudden, Joe's kind of on his own. He's trying to deal with that. I mean, he's jealous, um, not in a love triangle way, but just like, you know, he was the most important guy in their life. And now, 
he's not. Mm-hmm. So it's about how he deals with it. So this sounds more like, um, and where does it take place, by the way? Um, in Kalamazoo. Okay, so it, I mean, this almost sounds like it's a That's like Michigan. it's a yeah. like it's a small small town romance type of genre. So, what makes these thrillers? Um, the plot is pretty uh, intense. Um, Stewart, who is the love interest of Taylor, uh, he's got a stalker. Okay, and. Um, she gets wrapped up in that whole thing, thinking the FBI thinks that she's the stalker, and, you know, so they're kind of in danger because this person's coming after Taylor and her, you know, her family now. So you've got these elements of suspense and, and danger in here and, and crime and, okay. And and so, so do, does, because, so that was their rigid rules, correct? Yes. Okay, so for chemical attraction and chemical reaction, you've got the word chemical in there. We've got your science background. So are the next ones sort of like science thrillers? Is there is there any um, science-y stuff that, that comes into play in the plot with those? Oh, yes. Um, we talk about nanotechnology. Um, there's the whole issue with um, the flu being out there it has a part in it. Um, And this story is more of Joe, you know, in the first two books, he's, you know, he's been searching his whole life for that one person that's going to love him for his faults instead of in spite of. Mm -hmm. So he finally meets the person um, that he's supposed to be with, but she's like his contact on this case. So you've got this balance of, uh, you know, professionalism, but you can't do anything about it because, you know, you're working and... That doesn't always, you know, cross over. So has has Joe become the FBI guy in those in the second two books? Yes. Okay, so we've we've got kind of these FBI like procedural thrillers there with romance. So so I think that appeals to a, a very broad audience and which is great. Um so what was it like then, Christina, that you had fleshed out these characters in their rigid rules, but then that book wasn't actually published for quite some time. And you had, you kind of, you had your main reader base as you're, as you're building as a new author um, with chemical attraction and chemical reaction, where people are kind of meeting your characters more in the, in the middle of their story as opposed to having all this background on them. Um, in the meantime, you know, so how many years did you have these these two books out without the, the prequel? Um, and and did you find people were, you know, connecting with it, you know, just as well? Um, and, and what kind of made you decide, I want that prequel out there, that, that piece still needs to be filled in from the beginning? Yeah, Chemical Attraction came out, then Reaction, like, within a year apart, and then... Um, and that would have been, like, 20, 2011 or 2010 um, or what? 12 and 13. 12 and 13, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and then, um, you know, it's like they had such a rich background that I wanted to share, so that's why I submitted um, the rigid rules to Juanita um, at 4814, and she liked that, and then... Um, there's such a gap between their rigid rules and chemical attraction. I think it's like seven or eight years. Mm -hmm. So I wrote the kindred code, which is like the sequel to, um, their rigid rules to fill in that, that other gap. So that, so, so you kind of wrote this, um, you wrote their rigid rules first, then the, then the second two, and then you kind of went back and squeezed one in there to, (laughs) (laughs) yeah. Yeah. And then in between that seven, eight year gap, Mm -hmm. I wrote um, Searching for Her, which is an anthology of short stories. And it's all about the characters. So it's kind of for Joe's story leading up to Chemical Attraction, where um, it's just more of of how his life is. You know, he's he's got a great career, but he's still missing a part of it, you know, a part of love, a part of his life. So... As far as Joe goes, I loved him in, as a minor, you know, secondary character in their rigid rules, and I just, he needed his own uh, love story. So that's how Chemical Attraction came about. 
and often that does happen. We just kind of latch on or fall in love with the character, even a more secondary one, and find that they kind of steal the show and end up end up taking the series as their own. I, I know that's happened to me with my writing experience as well. Um, so you are you're involved in in or your background, I should say, is not only in biology and science, but you also seem to have an interest more on the spiritual and metaphysical end of things. And so do any of those holistic and healing practices and beliefs show up in your fiction writing at all? Um, and slash, or do you ever use your fiction and your novels to communicate any of your um, beliefs or, or deeper messages in there? Uh, well, I think, you know, most of the messages in my stories are about, you know, finding that connection with someone that, that understands you, that um, kind of um, makes you better. So as far as the holistic side, you know, there's, it's a spiritual, you know, the universe has a plan and, um, you know, you can either fight it or embrace it. So these characters, you know, in the beginning fight it and then finally give in to it and they're happier for it. So it's a matter of, you know, letting the universe take over sometimes. Um, but as far as like a, being a holistic practitioner, um, I had this past life um, session. I don't know if you're familiar with past life regression. I've actually written a series of books called The Past Life Chronicles. So yes, very. The girl oh, falls nice. in love with her hypnotist who's regressing her. And so, yes, I'm familiar. <laughs> I like it. I like it. So are those out now? Yes, they are. I'll send okay. you them. <laughs> yes. Okay. But it's like I, uh, my first time that I had uh, a past life regression, um, it, w it totally changed how I write and it was pretty early on when I started writing. It's like, um, the session, uh, you know, it starts where, you know, you visualize your feet mm -hmm. and the relaxation. takes you into this deep trance, uh, mm -hmm. that practitioner does. And, um, for me, when I looked down at my feet, I, it was like tan, dirty feet of this young woman. And, um, when I observed her you know, looked around in her eyes. Uh, she was this, lived in this poor dirt farm with her elderly father. And at the, at the moment that I met her or became her, I, I'm not sure, you know, what the terminology would be, but um, she watched her beloved just kind of disappear over this hill in the distance. And um, what I felt for her was just such deep sorrow, like, uh, she spent hours watching this hill hoping that he would come back and it would just consumed her like every day of her, the rest of her lonely life she waited for this man to return and um, it, it just it was just a, such a profound sadness you know I cried it, st it still affects me when I when I think about it mm. that the only thing that she wanted in this simple life of hers was to be loved yes. and it just never happened for her and that just uh, affects my writing because it's like I strive to get those uh, emotions, you know, that tr transcend everybody's life, you know, to love and to be loved. So that really uh, brought it home for me to try and be more emotional with my stories. I got chills as you were telling me that. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you're familiar with, there's a website, um, beyondreligion.com. It's run by lovely man named John Sloat, um, who I've been in correspondence with basically since I was 14. <laughs> and um, they have a whole uh, page of the, they used to take reader submitted stories of um, people who spontaneously, you know, had visions or memories or, or whatever you want to call them that they believe could have been a past life, um, just experiences. And there's hundreds of stories on there. And I used to just click through and just read them one by one for hours and hours. Um, and so your story very much 
sounds like one of those that it's it's like a snippet, like a little snapshot right. of one moment. It's more about the emotion than any kind of detail or action going on. Um, it's more about this really strong, underlying, sometimes traumatizing emotion, sometimes profound joy, sometimes profound sorrow. Um, and and whatever it is, you know, whatever your beliefs are, uh, if you believe in reincarnation, like two thirds of the world does, or if you do not, um, there is wherever these these images or memories or visions are coming from, they they do affect us uh, emotionally, subconsciously, and they do have an effect on our uh, creative process. And so um, I think that's beautiful that in a way you are processing uh, the loneliness that you experienced in that vision um, and kind of correcting it through writing romantic stories where people get their happily ever after like the girl in your vision did not. And I find that I do that too, Christina. I I compensate for the way that I want the world to be <laughs> in my writing. Like I have one of my books, The Duchess's Descendants. They, you know, they're commissioned, you know, by the emperor to go out on an expedition and conquer and chart these foreign lands, but they arrive there and find them occupied by natives. And, you know, it, our real life, real world history tells us that this these this empire would have slaughtered these natives and claimed their stake of the land. But in my version, they they learn to you know they fall in love with the natives. They learn to assimilate. They it's a this peaceful you know I mean there's other drama that goes on to make it a story, but but I don't you know commit genocide. So I kind of rewrite history the way I wish it would have happened. You know for on the world's behalf. <laughs> and so I can I can relate to that idealism um you know from a, from a personal to a to a global scale. Um so I I wanted to ask you as well when you had finished writing your books um or at least your your first one, your first two, what made you decide to query those out instead of just self-publishing them, you know, uploading them to Amazon or just paying a vanity press. Uh, where did that ambition come from to find a publisher? And how did you find uh, both of your publishers, the the one that screwed you over and the, the good one? <laughs> the good one, yeah. Um, for part of me, I needed like the validation of, okay, I'm on the right track, you know, because you've got the inner critic going, uh, you know, you don't know what you're doing. You don't have a degree in writing. So having it, um, at least the first one, um, don't gone through a publisher was important to me. I mean, it, it, I guess it just depends on which, you know, what your intention is. Plus, I had no clue about social media at the time. <laughs> so that was another thing. It's like, how do I even promote these? I have no idea. And the best advice that Juanita gave me was um, get on Twitter and start following authors and see what they're up to and, you know, see how they're promoting. And that was like the best advice I ever <laughs> I ever had. Copy what everybody as, else is doing, yeah, right? Basically. <laughs> Do it better, yeah. <laughs> Put my own twist on it. So, yep. yeah. But, um, and then as I got more confident, you know, after the trucker cat got pulled, uh, it took me a year before I had enough confidence to self-publish that. And boy, that was a, a life lesson, you know, learning. I have a better appreciation for what Juanita does um, you know, editing and promoting and um, just formatting was crazy. It's very so. challenging to self pub to indie publish that first book with all those, especially if you're doing it on a budget. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely the budget. So, I mean, I have done it both ways and I can appreciate, you know, those that self publish because it is a big undertaking. And then I also appreciate, you know, what publishers do just because I've self-published. So, and and where did both ways. did you find the publishers on on a website or how you know how did you come across them? Did you was it a mutual friend or something that word of mouth or? Um, they've got those big thick books, um, like 
Barnes and Noble, Amazon, uh, like Writer's Guide. Right? Is uh, it the Writer's Market? Agents or, okay, you know, Writer's Marketplace or one of those those yeah, popular then, ones. Okay. You just get on each of their websites and see what they're looking for. So that was kind of like a process of, you know, I send a few out and then wait and write and then send a few more out. You know, I mean, I had over a hundred rejections Mm -hmm. but every once in a while they say oh I like the concept but it's not for us right now and that was you know the encouragement I needed to keep going Mm -hmm. yeah it's you face a lot of rejection especially in the beginning there and then it's funny people used to tell me um that oh it gets easier the more books you write well Unless they are like number one bestsellers, it's actually just as hard because then publishers or agents are no longer asking you um, for for more, you know, to see more of your story. They're asking you to they're asking to see your royalty uh, payments and sales reports. And so if you don't have something impressive to forward them, it's like you might as well just give up. <laughs> So it's actually it's you have a better chance as a new author because you don't have to show those those uh, royalty statements, which sometimes can be pathetic, um, as we all know in this industry. Um, <laughs> so so you found yeah we don't we do it for the love. Um, so you found your publishers through through those writers yeah, one of those writers guides some books websites, website. but I can't remember like. Um... There's always that writer beware, which is a great site. It mm-hmm. kind of um, tells you about the predator um, publishing companies out there. Yes. You know? So I always kind of like check with them too when I research. I do a lot more research now than I did back then. So, but I know a lot more. So. Yeah, and it and it feels like the internet has has just become more prevalent even in our process of making decisions you know we used to we used to kind of use our our brains more just guess on things and now it's like before I even decide what restaurant I'm going to eat at I go on Yelp and read all the reviews and you know um and look at the look at the menu on the website so yeah we I I think as a society as a whole we do a lot more research now before (laughs) on the internet um before before we make any decision um, so what prompted, so you've, you've had these beautiful makeovers to your books. You've got new covers. Um, did you, did you have another round of edits? It, um, just briefly tell us, uh, what prompted the makeovers done to your four books with 4814? What changes were made? Um, and, and how would you say you've grown as a writer between when the books were first published and when they were republished in the, the second editions? Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> um, well, part of the reason was when I wrote the Kindred Code, it was considered the sequel to the prequel. So that was kind of like a big mouthful. So that's when we, when Juanita and I decided to um, put all the books in chronological order. Mm-hmm. So the first two are kind of um, the story, and then that sequel, and then Chemical Attraction, and then its sequel with Reaction. So we decided, well, let's get all new covers that kind of match. And I love my covers. I just love the simplicity of it. Um, And it really tells the story of each book, you know. In the first one, The Rigid Rules, you know, it's about the fire. And her Taylor's plan just kind of goes up in flames because she's, you know, met this guy. And uh, he just kind of, like, burned her plan, basically, uh, fallen in love. And then The Kindred Code, it's takes place during the winter um so it's kind of like the follow the follow-up like i think there's maybe a week uh in between the two books um and the chemical reaction it's all about social media and, and you know joe's getting all these calls from women and every time it's the most inopportune time that he gets his call because he's trying to make headway with with madeline the you know the female character and then with um, um, chemical reaction, you know, I've got this uh, this beaker floating in the water, and I just love that because that's kind of like um, I don't know metaphor for their life. You know, they're just kind of floating there. Um, and then 
you know, when I got those makeovers, I decided I wanted to make over um, one of the self-published books, um, The Garden Collection. And originally, my daughter did the the um, design of it, which I love. So that's kind of my favorite book right now. Um, and it's more of a Cinderella story. Mm-hmm. And I think with the new, the new updated cover for that kind of gives it that fairy tale feel, which I love. And was there anything um, apart from the covers that was changed? Did you go through another round of edits or change the stories at all for, or is it the same interior? Um, We did a lot of uh, making things fit. Like if there was like a timeline kind of issue, Um, you know, one of the things that I learned chemical attraction from the get go was, um, you know, kind of promote it as a romance and then also as a thriller and you know I thought it would bring in two different types of readers but what happened was um, the romance readers they there wasn't enough romance in it for them and then for the thriller there was too much romance so so there was like a a no-win situation basically uh, so what we did was we kind of upped, amped up the emotion. So it's more of a romantic thriller. Yeah, that's uh, a that huge, <laughs> yes, that's a huge genre. Romantic suspense and romantic thriller is a, I mean, there's a whole line of Harlequin books, like Harlequin suspense or intrigue or whatever, um, that is with that genre. So that was, that's interesting to me when you said that people on both ends were complaining because that romantic suspense, romantic thriller tends to be a crowd pleaser. Um, but it, it sounds like, so you, you amped up some of the emotion in there and did you like add in any sexy scenes or, <laughs> or you didn't push it that far? Yeah, there's mm-hmm. amped up scenes. Nice. So yeah, my kids don't read my stories because, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's definitely more emotional, uh, more of a, the connection. Mm-hmm. Um, there's still the strong plot, but, um, I would say it's more romance now than it was before. That's another so. thing that I, I love about working with 4814. They kind of let me do the same thing with my book, The Duchess Quest. Um, when it was first published, it was, you know, we were marketing it as a fantasy romance, you know, which, I mean, there are plenty of, there's a, there's a genre of fantasy romance, but we kind of met the same thing. It was that the fantasy fans, um, it was too much focused on the characters were too much focused on their relationships and then for the romance readers the fantasy aspect and the whole you know world building aspect threw them for a loop so we couldn't find that happy medium and so it took me um when i recognized that the people who seemed the most interested in it um from everything from the cover to the concept was more of the ya crowd like the 13 to 29 you know those were the people who were connecting with it and and then I felt bad about selling it to 15 year olds at the street fair because I knew that there was like a graphic sex scene in it and I would even I would even mention to their mothers like before they bought it like mom I just want to let you know there's a scene in there and I I just can't feel right with myself without at least telling you before I take your money you know and they're like oh it's okay should she get she sees that in movies and she's gonna hear about it at some point And so, um, you know, and I just started feeling bad about it. And, you know, and there was also stuff with the Me Too movement that a lot of romance writers are facing this now that some things that were considered, I'm not going to say okay, but um, some things that could have, that people could overlook or forgive a character for now there's a zero tolerance. And and so, um, so I had to, I had to go in, I, I contacted Juanita, I said, I am... I'm unable to continue writing because this is bothering me so much, you know, and I'm, as I'm continuing writing the series, I can't, I can't continue writing it when I know that there are some like foundational issues with the first book. And if I can't sell that first book, then I can't sell anything else I'm writing after it that's in that series. So um, she was amazing and, and totally gracious and let me basically rewrite the book as a young adult novel and take out all the sex and the anything, you know, anything horribly offensive. I mean, there's still plenty of of romance and innuendo. um, And I mean, I guess it's more new adult, which I I guess they're saying that's no longer a genre. I don't know. Um, But it's it's more like upper YA or it's for 
for, you know, 20 somethings or 30 somethings. Um, but I mean, it's for anybody, but she, she let me kind of rebrand that and, and rework that to make it fit with a wider market. And, um, and so it's so, it's so fun talking to you with the same publisher and, and, um, a similar experience where, you know, you're able to grow with the publisher, find out what worked, what didn't work, repackage right. it, fix it up so that it fits the market. And it's not many publishers will do that will take that kind of time um, or or investment to do that with right. you. So I know we're super lucky. Yeah, um, I'm very grateful. Yeah. Who? By the way, who designed your new covers for the the Chemical Attraction series? Um, that was Ampersand. Ampersand. Books. Yes. Yes, they are. They're good. They did. Um, they did Ebony. Um, E. E. R. Dell's book, the the fourth piece, and that cover is just gorgeous. They they are very talented. Um, yes. Yeah. So and the other thing about the the re the redo is that those typos that drove me crazy. Mm -hmm. when I, <laughs> you got to fix them. Fixed. I was like oh. <laughs> Every time, you know, it's such like, a oh. it's such a relief. I will say that is the one thing that I love about indie publishing is when a reader writes me that they found a typo, I can just go in and immediately fix it. <laughs> and, and with a publisher, you can't do that. Yeah. But um, so I I think it's so it's so neat, Christina, that you know, because because everybody else I've spoken to, it's like, oh, I've been writing since I was seven, and I, you know, and I've been a big fan of the whatever series since I was a small child. I never really had a chance, you know, to do anything other than this. I think that that's brilliant and that's beautiful that it was in your adult life and your married life, and it was your husband's that introduced you to this wonderful world of fiction. And so I want to know. Um, for anybody else out there who may be already an adult with an established field or career that has nothing to do with creative writing, but suddenly they find themselves with an interest in it, um, how would you advise them? You know, what would be your your guidance? to those people, um, as well as not only those who are, who are coming into the, the writing world, maybe later in life or in their adult life, but also anybody who, you know, other biologists or acupuncturists <laughs> or massage therapists who now want to write a romantic thriller. What's your advice for them? Well, if I can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> it just takes a lot of work, but just, you know, get rid of all that external noise, um, and some of the internal noise about, well, oh, I don't know if I can do this, just do it, and then see what happens. Um, that was pretty much my, you know, my mantra from the beginning. It's like, well, okay, I've got this idea. Okay, let's see if I can make a story. Okay, I made it a story. It's not too bad. I mean, let's edit it, and, and then, okay, well, my sister loved it, and, you know, and her opinion matters to me, so it's like, all right, well, let's just push it out there. So it's just a process. So, I mean, I guess my biggest advice is just, just do it, you know, don't think about all the other stuff. I don't know, does that make sense? It does, yeah, and you know, they say, they always say write what you know, when you don't know where to start, you know you want to write, they say write what you know, and I think somebody who's experienced quite a bit of life, or who has a background in something totally different, um, actually can write a more interesting story because you have all this knowledge that you can build off and incorporate into your story that the average person can't. And so like, so I just find that, you know, I find that awesome. Um, are you currently working on anything right now? I am. I'm doing a lot of research. Um, I'm at that stage right now. Um, last year, my father passed away. And, oh, my condolences. Um, those things, and we found a lot of um, his letters that he wrote home um, during his uh, when he was a soldier during the Korean War. Wow. So I wanted to kind of bring those um, letters to life, uh, more for my family. But um, the more I'm getting into it, I think it's going to be more of like a historical fiction uh, in that kind of genre. So um, it's it's slow going because it's very emotional. Wow. But I think it's going to be really good when I get it done. 
Wow, that's that's a beautiful project and and what a way to honor your father and tell history through letters. I, I mean, I had chills as you were describing that. So, so my condolences on your father's passing and, um, and we are grateful for his service. My father-in-law also served in the Korean war. Um, he just turned 90 actually. Wow. So, yeah, he's, um, so where can people either get in touch with you or find out when that new release is coming out? Um, well, if you want to learn about the characters of the series, um, you can find me on um, Facebook. It's the Chemical Traction series. Um, if you want to learn more behind the scenes, you can follow me on Instagram, which I just I just started doing that. So it's more of, you know, uh, personal pictures, I guess you would say. And that's under Christina K. Thompson. Um, and then I'm on Twitter. So you can find me that at Christina POV. So those are the main places that you can find me. And then, of course, my website and 4814's website. And remind us of your website. That's ChristinaKThompson.com. Yes. Lovely. Well, that wraps up today's program. If you like what you heard, please consider hitting that subscribe button on my YouTube channel. You can get a hold of me in the comments or via the handy dandy contact form on ckbrook.com. Be sure to visit me and check out my books there as well as on Amazon. Christina, after so many years of knowing who you are and communicating with you over at 4814 and Facebook, it's been a pleasure to finally get to speak with you and hear your lovely voice. And I had so much fun this morning. I wish you all the best of luck with, um, with your current work in progress. Thank you for your time today and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much and stay warm over on that east side of Michigan. <laughs> I will I will certainly try and you too over on the west side. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye-bye.